The inside track number one. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Welcome to the Inside Track, a new monthly series where we look at what's new at the Tank Museum and what's going on behind the scenes. My name's Nick and I'm joined by... Hello, my name's Stuart and I'm the museum's um, historian. Um, I'm David Willey, I'm the curator. Uh, I'm Rob, I'm from the exhibitions team. Coming up in the first episode, our tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth II, um, other museum news, our latest acquisitions, we take a look at one of our Victoria Cross winners and your recommended reading for the month ahead. But first, let's take a look at some news. We start with our tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. This month, the nation mourned the loss of Queen Elizabeth, so let's look back at the late Queen's visits to the Tank Museum. So, Stuart, I know this is something you've been looking at. Um, her vis first visit to the Tank Museum was back in 1997. Yes, that's correct, Nick. She came here for the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Combray, um, and she was reviewing a, a Guard of Honour from the Royal Tank Regiment and their association. Mm -hmm. And um, it was doing that that she was photographed in the back of the Rolls-Royce armoured car? Yes, she was, and that was um, a very sort of uh, momentous moment for, for the museum. You know, to have her in, in one of our vehicles was, uh, was uh, fantastic. Um, and she also got to meet um, two veterans, um, Colonel Dillon and um, Captain Edwards, um, who both took part in the Battle of Combray. Mm -hmm. And that was the first royal visit to Bovington since the 1920s, wasn't it? Yes, you're really looking at sort of George V era, um, 1920s coming down here. So yes, her coming down here officially and, and, and marking the event of the, the Battle of Combray um, as Colonel of the Regiment um, was a major, a, a major sort of feat for the Royal Tank Regiment. And, and, you know, the photos just prove how much of, of an event it was. Mm. And 12 years later, she was back at Bovington with the late Duke of Edinburgh as well. And we were all fortunate enough to meet her. Yes, the, the idea was that she would also meet some veterans, so we, ha we were going to have Peter Gudgeon, unfortunately he was ill, he couldn't make it, but she did get to meet um, Joe Eakins, who was a uh, Northamptonshire Yeomanry. Um, and David's got an interesting... Yeah, no, we, we had to ask Joe, because um, for those of you who don't know, Joe Eakins is uh, credited with knocking out a number of Tiger tanks in Normandy. Joe was there, I, I asked him would he like to come down for our opening, and I hadn't realised he wasn't a particularly keen royalist, as it were, but he said to me, he said, um, well, if she says hello to me, I'll say hello to her. Mm. And of course, he came and had a great day, actually, at the time. And uh, that was, again, that business of the Queen being of the generation she was. She got on very well with the veterans mm. anyway. And everyone feeling quite starstruck when they meet her. What, what was it like to, for you guys to meet the Queen? Um, well, I remember she was just about two people away from me and uh, I felt a tingle on my ear and I, I, I went like that and realised there was a spider there, a large spider. And um, at that moment, I thought, if I can just throw it behind me, <laughs> no I might get away with it because, gone. yes, um, so that was it. And then all I was going through my head was the procedural bit of talking to her. Mm. But um, Prince Philip uh, was really um, interested in what we were doing and it was, it was a very you know, it was a high point of, of, our, yeah. of our careers. In some so ways. it sounds like you ruined the spider's day. I did, unfortunately. David, what did you say to the Queen? Um, yeah, I can't remember all this time. Probably some inanity that she's used to hearing from idiots all the time like us. But the one I always remember, though, is because we, it was beautifully captured with a photograph. Um, she is the Colonel of the Royal Tank Regiment, our then workshop manager, Chatty Taylor. He was there as part of the lineup. He'd met her on a number of other occasions. They had a couple of words, and there's a lovely shot of her walking away, smiling and chatty, laughing about Photo something we that was have, said. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but we'll never know. Will we? uh, I don't know that what made was said then, so but, but they obviously had their own private joke that way, and that was another one of those moments of um, yes, you know, anyone that served is obviously she was head of the armed forces, so there was a little bit more of a connection there as well. And meant a huge amount to the country, of course. Visitors during the morning period have been signing our wall of condolence, where we've gathered hundreds of messages in memory of the late Queen. It was. It was very popular, wasn't it? That little display temporarily. Yeah, it's we just had. a nice thing to do, and it's just so obvious that if you're not British watching this, that uh, it's yes, it was pageantry. It was amazing watching that funeral, but I do think for so many people in this country, all my life, all the lives of people here, that's been that thing in the background that seems to have always been there. And let's be honest, I don't think she put a foot wrong in the role. Mm. So it's going to be a very different period now as we all face a new world without that figurehead. Absolutely.
well, more sad news. Uh, in th This summer, we were also sad to learn of the death of Ken Tout. Ken was a veteran who'd, of World War II uh, who had served in the Northampton Yeomanry. And David, Ken was someone you knew quite well. Yeah, Ken um, was wonderful for the Tank Museum because he was very lucid, very friendly, and was really happy to share his stories. So we've been very fortunate to film him on a number of occasions, put him back in a tank, etc. And his accounts, he actually introduces our World War II display. Um, so you can see him actually talking there. But more importantly, I think overall is Ken wrote memoirs and books on the subject. Um, the one I particularly recommend, if you can find a copy, it's a bit expensive, it's out of print. Um, it's called Tank, it's 24 hours in combat in Normandy. He writes it as a novel but it's so obviously real, what goes on and how he describes things has is, is, is got a real um, sense of urgency and beautiful descriptions and you really think you, this is what it must have been mm. like. It's out of print at the moment, isn't it? So. It is, we're looking and seeing if we can see with the publishers getting it redone because it really deserves to be read by everyone who's interested, you know, as a, as a great first-hand account. And that was the thing with Ken, you know, I went to his funeral, I, I was part, doing a small part of the eulogy, but the, the thing there is you just suddenly realise that that's one part of this man's life that he goes on 98 years old, mm. you know. And he had a very distinguished career after Absolutely. leaving the military. Absolutely. Everything else he does, he's, he works, he's, he's a man of faith, he's, he's already, you know, working with the Salvation Army before he goes off to serve in World War II. Afterwards, he works with uh, the Red Cross, United Nations, he advises the Pope, um, he's in South America during uh, big earthquake recovery operations. And you can't help, you know, and he's, he's just, the, 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 the career he has is just staggering. But for me, I can't help but see it back to his role as a sergeant in charge of a tank crew in that fatherly role of making sure they're all supplied, ready, keeping an eye on things. And you can see that goes into his later life in all these things he does. So, yeah, wonderful guy, a real loss, but, you know, it's been a privilege to have known people like that. How do you think he'll be remembered? I think in turn, I think it's people reading his books because he's, he's a good historian. He writes up and the fact, you know, he picked up on, we mentioned already the Joe Eakin story, you know, that connection between, for them, this was just a battle. Mm. For so many people now, it's all about the Tiger tanks. He knocked out the fact one of them's Whitman. Well, those guys didn't know that at the time. Yeah. It well, was just can yeah. they, exactly, as Joe Eakin says, you know, bad guys in the wrong country wearing the wrong uniform. So, you know, but, but Kent out, very human, very honest, but, and he shared those stories and that, that's the thing. And, they, and I, all I'd say is recommend read those stories if you get the chance. That's uh, Ken Tout, who died at 98 years of age. Now, moving on, back in February, the Tank Museum acquired a blueprint of a First World War Mark I tank, and this summer it has been on display, although it has just been removed from display. David, can you tell us a little bit about what was so significant about this particular object? Yeah, it was drawn to our attention. It's basically something was found in an attic. Um, we, we don't know the full story of the house, etc. as yet. But it was found in an attic, a blueprint and two patent documents. And the relevant auction house who um, put this up for sale obviously made a big song and dance because this really is the earliest blueprint that exists still. Yeah. Tank Museum Archive, we have drawings um, of pre-production Mark I tanks. So beautiful drawn out line drawings in a drawing office. A blueprint is basically a photocopying system very early on. Which is like the production drawing, is it? Yeah, so you put over a sheet of light sensitive paper over the original drawing, expose it to light, you end up, the paper goes blue and you have a white line. So it's yeah. a way of reproducing things. This one is just before they start production. So it looks like it's got some changes compared to the actual Mark I tanks that go into production. Yeah but a real rarity nonetheless. And two documents, it looks like they were gonna be patenting some of the issues mm -hmm. to do with this. So how do you think they ended up just in a loft somewhere and what's the provenance? Have we any we, idea? We, 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 it could be that uh, I think the people who bought the house, it was what they found there, it wasn't theirs. Whether there's a way of tracking back someone who worked at Foster's mm -hmm. or something or other lived there before, we're not sure. And that may come to light in the future. Key thing was, it was the estimate was a lot of money. Yes. And where that's where, as, as us, an independent charity, etc. It's difficult for us are, to make purchases. It is. It? So buying things at auction like that, especially in this price range, but we're the obvious home for this. Yeah. So we were really lucky when a retired tank regiment officer, Tim Allen, came forward and basically said he'd back us at auction. 
So we were able to do an online bid. We had the, the item checked out. Very good friend of ours, Tim uh, Gwyn Evans, went up and had a good look at it just to make sure that what we're going to spend the money on is what it says it is. Um, so we were able to acquire it at auction. The problem, of course, we put it on display over the summer. The problem is it's still light sensitive. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it now has to go back in a drawer if we're going to preserve it for yeah. the future. That's another one of these dilemmas all museums have. You know, we're trying to look after the stuff, but we still want people to see it. Yeah. So if you want to know the full story about the uh, the Lost Mark uh, Mark 1 blueprint, you can actually read all about it in the current edition of Tracklink Magazine. If you want to know more about Tracklink Magazine, check it out on our website. Okay, moving on then. Um, it's uh, Earlier this month, we held our autumn model show with a range of models on display, workshops and demonstrations. It was also an opportunity for the Tank Museum to pull out and display some of the models in our collection that don't normally get to see the light of day. So, Stuart, you've brought one of them uh, with you today. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the object we've got in front of us. So about um, eight, nine years ago, Nick, I got contacted by um, the daughter of a Mr. Munns, and um, he turned out to be the chauffeur of, of General Martel, who was a leading advocate in the 1920s and 30s of, of, of tanks, and he wrote a book uh, called In the Wake of the Tank, and he had his one-man tanks um, going around. And he had this hood ornament um, basically designed and built for his vehicle and he had that put on his um, Sheffield Simplex um, car and chauffeur driven to all the events and, and, and exercises and, and he would have been, you know, as he came in, everyone would have known that was his car because it had this First World War tank um, emblem on it. So as well as uh, the Rolls Royces of, of the time and still do have the spirit of ecstasy, he was making a real statement with this piece which she would have had made for him. Exactly and it was really, so again, um, telling everybody this is me this is general martel and i am an advocate of of tank warfare and mechanization and so really associates him with the actual tank and and tank development fantastic stuff but we um we hold a range of different types of model don't we in in the tank museum's collection what kind of what kind of things do we have so we have a, yeah, we have a, a lot of models um we have manufacturers models where they've made the actual vehicle to to basically um be a smaller version of what they actually produce so it's like a, a li literally um what you're going to get exactly we then have concept models these are ideas that come off the, the blueprints come off the drawings and basically these are the models for the for the next stage and then if they're going to go ahead and they get production, they will go onto the vehicle. A lot of these don't go anywhere, and in most cases, we've got the only thing that we've got left of them is the actual model. So these are really quite significant because they show you um, cul-de-sacs where designs didn't go further. So they're very interesting. And then we've got things like target and recognition models. Mm -hmm. These are all made of wood or they're made of metal or plastic. Um, and these are used for, again, for training purposes um, and allowing the troops to get an idea of what a silhouette is like. Obviously. Yeah, so one of the things I remember seeing is we have a little box of sort of Soviet vehicles, don't we? Little, little miniature Soviet vehicles so they could sort of leg them on the table and, and get an idea of what, what to look out for, basically. Exactly. We, we do threat-based um, recognition even now. So the idea of, of, of tank is getting an idea of what the actual vehicle looks like at distance, but just that scale of how many road wheels it's got, what the turret looks like, etc. You can do that so well with a model. And we still get donations of models even now. And, you know, we're sat before one right here which uh, looks very similar to the vehicle which we're sat in front of. Tell us a little bit about this recent donation. So this came by the nephew of, of, of Mr Lowe who um, basically he joined the Motor Machine Gun Corps in 1915 um, very early on, um, went to Thetford, goes to France um, and serves with the Tank Corps at that time, um, Battle of Arras, wins the military medal, even if we think he was at the Battle of Combray, he becomes an instructor comes back here to Bovington, and we're thinking that this was built around 1918, 1919, probably in the um, tank workshops here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made of copper, it's riveted little panels all over it. It shows a real accomplishment and, 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 and skill. In, exactly, in, in actual that sort of model engineering side of things. Completely and scratch built, I mean, that's exactly. hours of work. Yeah, yeah, hours of work, dedication, and it shows his, his skill levels because he's actually replicating what we've got behind us. Yeah. 
So as we've just seen, it's not just, um, um, it's not just tanks in our collection. We receive dozens of new artifact donations every month. And uh, I know Stuart and David have brought with them a couple of things which uh, stand out in their minds as being particularly interesting. So uh, David, did you want to go first? And yeah, I've got, sorry, I've got the glove here. Um, sometimes we wear gloves, sometimes we don't metal work nice shiny metal work we don't want to leave um, fingerprints on this one but in this particular case i've opened this up this is something called a gravity knife the idea is that you the blade can actually go back inside the area of the handle i'm not going to force it actually it's, it's a little bit delicate here um, but it was given to the Luftwaffe crews, air crews, and more famously, as we tend to know it as, as a German paratrooper's knife now. So it's not a fighting knife, though, is not it? Not the so idea. So the idea was it's got a marlin spike on it, which is that spike for our helping undo knots. But the knife which blade itself was normally hidden in the handle. You use this little notch on the top to actually open it up and the knife will drop down if it's held. Um, so again, that the idea of the gravity bit, the knife will drop out and lock into place. So if you're one hand, if you've got one hand free, you can... That's the idea behind it. So you can cut yourself down if you're caught in your parachute shrouds or so electrical wiring or something like that, that you're being able to free yourself up. And this was actually brought back from Northwest Europe by a veteran called Charlie Burgess, who we interviewed. He's in our World War II displays now. And it's one of those sort of typical things. That the lovely thing is his daughter, Diane, who handed this over to us, made mention that he was uh, using this as his letter opener for a number of years um, until the kids got too interested, I think, and it was put out the way. Um, but it's lovely for us to have. Um, Charlie, again, another one of these veterans that we interviewed, his, his stories there, he's telling those stories. And Diane, again, his daughter, that was fascinating as well, was after the interview, he was much more willing to talk about mm. his wartime experiences to the family as well. It kind of opened him up a yeah. bit. And, uh, so and that's Diane's the relevance of, of that, because, you know, we're, we're a tank museum, but the relevance is that there's a story behind this. We know the person who collected it. Do we know how they came to find well, it? Well, in this, this case, we don't. Um, he also came back apparently with a Leica camera, and that was subsequently thrown out when they got a better camera in the family. But it's that idea of the souvenir, you know. So soldiers will always bring knives and daggers. We always know the, that sort of wartime stuff. But for us, it's just it's lovely to have something like that associated with a veteran we know about and that was their souvenir and I just make mention as well because a lot of people have got obviously grandpa's souvenirs still in the attic and everything just keep an eye on things things like this now are technically illegal in Britain because it's a hidden blade etc um, so you might just want to have a word with your local police um, just to check if you're trying to keep things like this what advice they give you um, and obviously this is the type of thing you don't want to be walking around the street with that in your pocket because no, quite understandably opening letters with it <laughs> Good tip, thank you. Um, Stuart, you've brought a photo album, so what's the story behind this? Well, Nick, we were approached um, just before COVID about this and we unfortunately weren't able to pick it up, but then I picked it up um, earlier in the year and basically um, it came from the, the, the son of Henry Brooke, who, who just died before he was 100. And basically what we have is a photo album um, collage that basically records his, not only his his basically military career with 5th RTR, but also his journey as a, an immigrant coming from um, Czechoslovakia to London in about 1938. Mm. And it shows him coming to London, basically um, meeting a girl, basically marrying her, wooing her, going on honeymoon, and then basically going through training. And then we see this basically record of his life and career in the, in the tanks all the way through. And it so shows- So he joins 5th RTR? This Royal Tank Regiment, yes. So we see he's got some aircraft recognition, yes. part of his training at Catterick, I can see there. Exactly. So he uses this, he uses cutouts, he uses menus, he uses little bits that have importance to him. And you get this day-to-day -day record or, or um, basically a picture on his life of what's going on. So he's giving you an insight into what's actually happening behind the scenes, but also what of his thoughts and, and processes that are going on. And this is all significant to him. Yeah. So it's a really a interesting... record of one man's exactly. war, basically. And I see here we've got some... Well, they will be unique, won't they? Unique photographs taken by him. It's very unusual for a frontline soldier to be carrying a camera in combat, isn't he? How do you think he got away with it? I think he kept it quiet. Yeah. Um, I th these were obviously put together after the, after the war, but yeah, he would have been taking photos um, um, probably surreptitiously with, with people who he was okay with, not a problem, but it was probably, look, you know, you didn't want to make a big thing of it, but, you know, um, 
He, it's, it's an outstanding record, though, because you get this first-person view of him sitting in the turret and basically uh, pointing the camera forward, but also we get these views as they liberate the town, especially in Belgium. So we can see here it's the 5th of September, is that 1944? And yeah, he's exactly. taken some photos that we have seen similar photos before, but you can see the sort of recently liberated civilians celebrating on the British vehicles as they're passing through. So yes, he takes you on a journey, his journey um, through to Hamburg at the end of the war. So you're filling 5th RTR, but you're seeing it as well. And, and you see the joy of the people's faces and you, you, really, you, you, know, you can look at these, um, you can look at these photos for hours on end because there's so much to see on them. And it's, a, it's, it's basically that, that moment captured for posterity. And it's fantastic because we didn't know this existed. Yeah, yeah. And that's Incredible. I mean, it's amazing that even now, isn't it, that things are kind of coming out yeah, of the woodwork. I, so I, I was going to say, it's, it's, it's items we've been gifted all the time. The blueprint, for example, things we didn't know exist. And there's still stuff emerging that adds to the story and of course we're always interested in hearing or sometimes as well people just want to know if they've got things of significance that's one of the other things that sometimes people contact us is this worth saving what do i do with this and that's something we can always help advise on as well if in doubt call a museum yeah <laughs> We're sat before the museum's Whippet tank, as you can see there, and it's just one of the vehicles in our collection with an incredible human story behind it. Um, we have Rob here from our exhibitions team, and he's going to be telling us more about it. So, Rob, tell us briefly, if you can, just a little bit about the Whippet tank. We've got a model here as well. What, what, what's it for? Uh, so, it was mainly designed with the idea of speed in mind. Uh, it's quite good you've got both tanks here, you can compare them. Um, they look fairly similar, but they've got a lot of differences. The idea with the Whippet was that it would be able to take advantage of the gaps made by the heavy tanks and the infantry, mm. um, get ahead of the line and try and carry on the advancement there. So when we say speed, though, I mean, that's a relative term. We have yeah. uh, the, the sort of rhomboid-shaped tanks moving at about three miles an hour. These guys were going at? A whopping eight miles an hour. Speedy Hence indeed. the name Whippet. Speedy indeed. OK. Uh, but this tank here, we know exactly who is commanding it, don't we? Yeah, this is um, one of the good examples we've got of armoured vehicle, personal story and personal collection items. Uh, so it was commanded by Cecil Sewell, mm. uh, came from a family of five brothers and two sisters, uh, joined up and went for the, to the front in France in 1915, uh, eventually made his way into a C Battalion, uh, where he ended up commanding a section of the Whippet tanks. Yeah, and what we actually have in front of you here, tell us a little bit about what we can, we can see on this, uh, this, this plaque here. Yes, yeah, so this is a collection of medals that were gifted to us uh, by his family. Um, I think about the 1970s. We've got his uh, death penny and then a collection of medals. Uh, we have the VC 1914-15 star, uh, war medal and victory medal as well. And these medals belong to Sewell? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so what actually happened then? I mean, we see a Victoria Cross and a death penny, which mm. uh, tells us part of the story, but perhaps yeah, you can so fill us in on the rest. Here's the story really of kind of gallantry and heroism. Um, that's me quoting from his VC um, ceremony as well. Uh, so the story goes, it was uh, August 1918, shortly before the armistice. It was part of the, the last great push before that. Um, he was commanding his section of whippets, uh, advancing ahead of a group of New Zealand infantry when uh, one of his other whippet tanks side-slipped into a shell crater, uh, which was quite a big problem for tanks of the First World War. Um, he stopped his, got out of his own whippet tank. So the crew was way. stuck, right? And they, they were couldn't stuck, get out. Yes, it, it side-slipped in. They, they couldn't get out of the back door, so there's a door at the back of the whippet. Um, and it burst into flames? It caught fire as well. Really all, all round bad situation for them. Um, but he left his tank, made his way across the battlefield under fire uh, and began using his tools to dig them back out from that. Uh, he was able to get them out and they made their way over to safety. Yeah. And whilst he was doing that, what happened? Uh, so he turned around to go back to his own tank and found, uh, I think it was Gunnar Knox, one of his own crew, injured behind his own tank. He once again headed back across uh, the battlefield, uh, was hit once um, by the enemy. Still carried on, made his way to his fallen comrade, but unfortunately was hit again, uh, this time fatally. So, I mean, basically what was what, the reason for him winning the Victoria Cross in this case is he literally sacrificed his own life to save those of his own crew and the crew of his, uh, his other tank. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously he sacrificed himself. The, we've also got a case behind the whip behind us uh, where we have medals from one of the crew members that he actually saved. 
uh, who would frequently state that he, the only reason he was still alive was because of the heroic actions of Sewell that day. And we have a picture of Sewell here. I mean, he looks incredibly young. Just, just how old was he at the time? Uh, he was only 23. Um, the average uh, age of mortality of soldiers was about 27 in the First World War, so even by that average he was still, still fairly young. Um, the real kind of sad part of the story was, um, as I said, he was a family of five brothers. Yeah. Only two of them actually survived the war to the end. Incredible. And David, this is something you might want to come on and really. What, you know, what do you think stories like Sewell's story kind of give to our visitors? Um, I'd, I'd just say when, when we go around, obviously we've, we're very lucky here with a collection of tanks, but it's having a personal story about that actual tank is one of the things sometimes. And another one is we're still a teaching establishment and it's amazing how young soldiers, male and female these days, you still want heroes. There's no two ways about it. You want examples to give and, and exemplars. And someone like Sewell doing what he does, you know, and he's sacrificed that way, and he's a youngster, and that background behind it, it's great having this layering we can do with a, with a story. It's not just the tank, a representative example. It's the tank. They actually brought it back as a memorial tank. It used to sit outside many years ago down at Lulworth, etc. Mm. But it was this idea, it's a tank with a specific story and what a story. So, so David, just, just quickly, could you just tell us, and we've talked about the Victoria Cross, if you could just tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the other items. Yeah, the death penny was given to basically every family um, that lost someone in the First World War, if you're army. So th it's a beautiful design and people still find these ones, as they will the other medals, because they were issued named on the side in the First World War to the recipients, what you would be very lucky to find, I think, in a drawer is that Victoria Cross. Um, and all the Victoria Crosses won by tank crews in the First World War, and here's one of those ironies, they were won outside the tank, mm -hmm. because you have to be seen doing that brave act by other people to warrant getting that VC. So again, that's one of these remarkable things that we're so lucky to have the family donated it many years ago and it's in the collection here and again you know it's that the the, the highest bravery award and when you hear the story you understand why you got it mm, absolutely moving on recommended reading uh, every month we'll be asking david and stuart to recommend a book to you all to read and um, we'll start with uh, stuart if we may uh, stuart what book are you going to recommend for us this month i'm recommending steve zaloga's um armored champion um mm -hmm. steve's a um an American historian, you know, he's, he's been going since the 1970s, a modeler as well, um, written over 200 books for the Osprey series, and he's a, a, a leading historian on American um, tanks and, 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 and Soviet tanks. Um, and basically what he does with this book is he looks at World War II year by year and effectively compares um, the tanks of each nation and, and looks at their effectiveness and, and comes out with the best tanks of those periods. And it's a, if you wanted a one book hit on World War II and the tanks there and a very concise and expert opinion, this is the book to buy. So it's answering those kind of questions that we often want to know, which is the best between this one and this one. It's quite a difficult uh, debate, but it looks like he's, he's cracked it in that it's, He's cracked it. And it, it, it's, as I said, it, it, from a, a one book um, sort of uh, viewpoint, he really allows you the insight into how the crews operate, how tactics operate, and how the tanks were deployed, and why they progress and evolve in the way that they do. So it's worth pointing out, it's um, armoured is spelt the American way, so if you're searching for it, you have to remember to drop the U. Oh yes, yes, De def definitely go for the, uh, the armoured with the, without the U. Okay, and David, what have you bought for us? Yeah, this is a book I bought myself for more money, I have to say, than uh, we're now selling it for in the shop. This is £4.99, it's our Haynes manual on the Vickers machine gun. Um, and for me, it's just a beautifully illustrated book uh, that tells you all the story about the Vickers, which of course was fitted in a number of armoured vehicles and is, you know, that iconic First World War machine gun. Very that goes key on weapon, into, wasn't it? Absolutely, but it goes everywhere. on to service well into the 1960s and a number of other nations using it still. Um, done there by Martin Pegler, who was at the Royal Armouries. He knows his stuff. Well, I just mentioned these things as well. At £4.99 in Britain at the moment, that's about the price of a pint of beer. If you're ordering something from the shop, these are the types of things like, I would so recommend that what you get for your money there for £4.99, it's worth adding to your order. And I also make mention as well, because um, what book can you get on a machine gun that actually ends up with a photograph of not just, dare I say, Bridget Bardot, but Jean Moreau in the back there firing a Vickers machine gun. So worth it, just £4.99 for that one photograph, I would argue. Um, but that's my personal taste there. 
Thank you very much. Both of these books you'll be pleased to hear are available from the Tank Museum's online shop. So if you're interested, go to tankmuseumshop.org. And also, it would be churlish not to remind everyone that if you subscribe to our e-newsletter, everybody gets 10% off their first order. <laughs> Okay, now moving on, uh, those of you who watched our Salute to Model Making on our YouTube channel from last year will know that Stuart here is a keen model making. Uh, and if you didn't, and you're a fan of model making as well, be sure to check it out when you're done here. Now in this segment, we're gonna be asking Stuart for build recommendations. And to start with, we have this newly released brick tank model that Stuart has built for us. So uh, yeah, Stuart, um, tell us a little bit about this. I mean, you didn't just build this one for us this month, but actually you helped create the product. Tell us yes. a little bit about that. So, so Kobe, um, they come up with, well, we, we talk to them and we decide which type of vehicle we want to, to do next that's in the collection. Um, they then go back, they, they use drawings, photographs, etc. And what they do is they come back to me and say, is this accurate? Um, and then I go and check to make sure that the, the actual design that they're they've done in their brick form is actually accurate. What I like about the build and what's good is that if you're um, a person who wants to model but not get involved with paint or glue, this is perfect. That would You'd, suit me. I think. Exactly. And the great thing as well, Nick, is that, mm. you know, with my 135th scale plastic models, if I drop them, they mm. break. This can break, but you can put it back together again. <laughs> And, and, and so I think from, from a sort of, I th I, that's what I love about it. And you know, it doesn't look bricky. It doesn't look in that form. It, it's a really good representation. And yeah. you know, the, I know the amount of work that these guys put at, in Kobe to design these, and they are very accurate and um, really convincing. And we've just worked on the independent and one of the jobs was to check the, again, the accuracy of it. And the, um, the beret came up and I spotted that it had the um, Queen's crown on the RTR. Making it too recent. Yeah, on the raw tank core, make it, yeah, making it the, the wrong era. So what we did was make sure they put the king's crown, mm. which again is what we're gonna see with um, mm. um, Charles III. So again, brick tanks, very easy to build uh, in, in terms of their complexity, ideal for all ages. And like you say, uh, far less mess. A far less mess, and they come with a very, very comprehensive um, instruction booklet. So uh, again, I have to say that the Rolls-Royce Armoured Car uh, is available from the Tank Museum shop, and if you order it from us, we'll also throw in a Rolls-Royce Armoured Car Haynes Manuals, and as David was saying earlier, you can't beat a Haynes Manual in terms of their kind of digestibility and depth of information. But Stuart, we've got a bit of a challenge for you for the next, for the next episode. So in four weeks' time, we're going to want you to... Oh gosh, hang on, that's a big one. So a bit more of a challenge for you next time. We've got the Ryefield Models British Sherman VC Firefly for you to um, have a look at. So what we want to do for the next time is we kind of want you to build it, paint it, and tell us what you thought about it. We're gonna have a little bit of a review on this, this particular one, if that's okay. What, what, what are your initial thoughts? My initial thoughts is, is looking at the side of it, it's, it's very detailed. Um, mm. And there's a lot of additional uh, items in there that gives you that, 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 that level of detail that you're looking for. You know, again, you can have the hatches open, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that this is gonna be a very, um, very good build. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've never made one of their models before, so this will be very interesting for mm -hmm. me, and, and, and it'll see how it goes together, and um, I'll let you know if I have any Interesting. Problems. Well, the, <laughs> the good news is the nights are drawing in, so it'll have plenty of time to work on that. Okay, well, that's almost all from us this month. Thank you to David and Stuart and to Rob uh, for joining us. Uh, remember, the Tank Museum is a registered charity, and we will welcome your support for our work. You can either support us on Patreon or support us uh, on YouTube. Super thanks as well. But before we go, um, just what is coming up on our YouTube channel later this month? David, your next Tank Chat is? I think by the time this one goes out, the one you'll be seeing next from me will be the French Samoa tank, which is a tank from the late 30s the Germans used as well in World War II. And so on your anti-tank chat? I will be doing the Panzerfaust, the Armoured Fist. Brilliant. Well, that's all from us. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>